When you think Canadiana, you might think of maple syrup, a warm cup of coffee, or even our gorgeous landscapes. Get ready as we share a little of what makes Canada so unique on Spotlight Features Canadiana. In the spirit of respect and truth, we want to honour and acknowledge that we're filming in Bawating, Sault Ste. Marie. We're on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe. Under the Robertson-Huron Treaty, we want to recognize the traditional territory of Batuana First Nation, Garden River First Nation, and the Métis as well. And I'm Ryan. We're tour guides here in the beautiful Algoma region. Today we're excited to share a collection of stories from individuals who are all proud Canadians. First, we head out to Cranbrook, BC, where one man shares his passion for the sport of lacrosse with youth from many walks of life. Lacrosse provides a unique opportunity for Canadians to lay claim to a sport that was developed here. You know, there's not a lot of sports we can say that, right? Lacrosse is ours. Started here, we perfected it, we've created the rules. It's called the medicine game. And I think it's called the medicine game because of the physicality and discipline required to play it that Indigenous people knew that once you played a game of lacrosse, you would have a mental relaxation. I was introduced to the sport in University of Saskatchewan by a, a lacrosse legend named Alan Lusick. I'll never forget the day we went to the YMCA and played in a gymnasium and on the way home uh, myself and my other friend that was with me uh, declared that lacrosse was now our favorite sport over hockey. It's an incredibly athletic, physical and disciplined game. It really forces players to use you know, speed, strength, their brain, their discipline. For the longest history of Canada, lacrosse was known as its national sport. In 1994, they added hockey as the national winter sport and moved lacrosse to be the national summer sport. That was a real testament to the indigenous roots of the game. Many people believe it started in the Kahnawake region, Southern Ontario, Quebec. It was used by indigenous people to not only solve disputes, but also train for war and as a game. When I went up to the Arctic in 1998 to be a teacher, I wanted to try to assist, as a teacher should, a change in some of the attitudes of the, of the students. We introduced lacrosse and the Inuit players up there really gravitated to it quickly. They have incredible hand-to-eye coordination and, and are incredible athletes. So it took them, you know, practices, and I mean literally like one to two practices for some of them to become very proficient players. They began to learn about its indigenous roots, which they congregate to up in the Arctic. They love indigenous sports and they love the history behind it. I think for a lot of kids up there, the medicine game part of it was very true for them daily. You know, they're dealing with some, some serious things happening at home. They play a game of lacrosse for an hour and they feel relieved and excited and the endorphins are released in their body. The impact of the game up there became so profound that through a series of, of media pickups, they eventually did a motion picture on the program we developed up there with you know, a much uh, more handsome and in-shape fellow playing me. This is a game, a game like every other game we've played. You're gonna be excited, you're gonna have adrenaline pumping. You need to get that through your system on the first shift. And I'll tell you right now, if you take them lightly, 
You will regret it. Settle your feet, get into this game quick, stay focused, and bring it. Bring it. Let's go. Drive it. Seeing what the game did for the people that needed it really helped me understand that sport, and lacrosse in particular, could be something more than a game. There's a lot of kids in Cranbrook that are dealing with a lot of their own demons, and, and so, you know, having kids in our club right now that are using the game that I, you know, that I know are using the game to overcome some of those demons is still as rewarding as it was when I worked in the Arctic. No, just win it, settle it. Some kids, it won't be lacrosse, it might be music. But for some kids, it is lacrosse. And my job is to try to expose as many kids to a good, positive lacrosse experience as I can. Building sandcastles is a classic summer activity for kids and adults at beaches across Canada. Next, we meet an artist whose love for building sandcastles turned into a sand sculpting career that has taken him all over the world, including Canada's top sand sculpting competition in Parksville, British Columbia. You're either a person who likes to create something or you might not be. And, and so the idea of hanging out in the sand and getting wet and dirty just might not really be what a lot of people would want to do. But for those who do, it's a fantastic way to release creative energy. Taking that creative energy, transforming blocks of sand into awe-inspiring creations, Canadian sculptor Fred Dobbs has been following his passion for sand sculpting over the last 35 years. I actually got my start in Ireland. I was a little boy when my dad buried me in the sand and, and proceeded to make me in a convertible sports car. And he made the wheels, the body, the chassis, and there I was in the, this car making the steering wheel. It wasn't maybe 20 years later that I actually started looking at it and I'd heard about a contest at White Rock and I was blown away. So I got back into it to do sand sculpting as a com competition. And then later what happened is I realized there was another world that existed of professional sand sculptors. What started out as just a hobby transitioned into a full-time career. Fred has built hundreds of sand sculptures all over the world, both solo and part of sand sculpting teams, winning several Canadian, US, and World Championship titles. To represent Canada at international sand sculpting competitions is, uh, it's sort of a proud moment. I feel uh, proud to be, if you will, kind of a sand ambassador when I travel. And it, it is a good feeling to know that you come from this beautiful country and it feels pretty cool to be celebrated in that way. I think the reason I like being a sand sculptor is because you're outdoors in many cases. You get to sculpt fairly large format. There's some setup, but there's not a lot. So you can kind of launch into it fairly quickly. When it comes to competition, sculptors constantly push their creative skills to the limit. Fred's success over the years is also because of his friendship with longtime sculpting partner, Ted Siebert. Ted and I have competed a lot together over the years. In fact, when we first started out, we were competing against each other. And the, the, the rivalry that actually existed was the, the basis that formed the friendship. We do have a similar sense of humor and um, the ideas that we come up with are somewhat shared. That's part of the chemistry, the idea that you're very similarly um, set in your mind about um, how you're approaching this task. I, I think as a sculptor in general, you are still learning because there's, I don't think really any way that you master it all. And when you see somebody do something really cool, it's one of those you, you celebrate that for what they did, but you also stick it in your back pocket and you go, that's cool, maybe I'll try that next time. Sculpting sand in front of crowds, whether internationally or close to home on Vancouver Island, continues to drive Fred's passion to create and compete.
One of the great things about being a sand sculptor is that you're outdoors and people are coming up and you're getting immediate responses. It is really cool when you're, you're getting that kind of a, a pat on the back. Sand sculpting can be a bit of both a feeling that it is stressful, but it also can be very joyful. And there is something about um, the, the perseverance that you need to endure this. The journey sometimes isn't easy, but um, it is one of those that it can be very rewarding in the end. And so the hard work pays off. The Canadian Bushplane Heritage Centre is an iconic part of our history and helped advance the country's development. Before becoming a museum, it was an available hangar for the Provincial Air Service. Inside, you'll find volunteer tour guide Dick Hetrick, who loves to find enjoyment sharing the tales of the bush plane. Well, this is Canada. <laughs> Iconic aircraft, famous in the world, designed and built in Canada, and the whole process of water bombing is a Canadian story, reaching these communities. Exploration, forest fires, taking people in and out of these remote communities. So, you know, the bush plane played such a role in the history of our country. I'm a retiree have volunteered here for 15 years. I love the place, love the history, love the people that work here. I love meeting visitors that come from literally all over the world. It's a passion to a degree, but I, I certainly enjoy the experience. They built the original hangar in 1924. The planes got larger, and eventually the hangar we're in here was built in 1948. You know, this is sort of a iconic place in Canadian history. There was a need for uh, forest fire air force <laughs> to be able to traverse the woodlands of uh, Northern Ontario. So the Ontario government created the Provincial Air Service. It was headquartered here in Sault Ste. Marie. The government started to buy water bombers in the 1980s. You couldn't get the water bombers through the doors. So this became obsolete, became a museum. The people here, the Provincial Air Service, flew the planes, would make suggestions to the manufacturers for improvement. The people here fell in love with what de Havilland produced, the most iconic bush plane ever built, the Beaver. But the Beaver, after World War II, uh, there was a need for a new bush plane. So de Havilland in Toronto basically designed the Beaver. The prototype flew in August of 1947. The beaver behind me was the first one off the assembly line in Toronto in 1948. So this beaver has serial number two. Prototype beaver, serial number one, is in our National Museum in Ottawa. There's stories related to, to all the aircraft, but essentially it's a Canadian story. So this is the uh, birthplace of water bombing, as I said, in the world. Basically, if you can tell the stories, interest people, it's rather exciting when you're talking to people from literally all over the world. Being part of a fairly dynamic group here that are all interested in seeing this place succeed ties a lot of stories together. Exploration, forestry, fighting forest fires. You know, this is Canada a country that we should be very, very proud of. It's, it's really something to be part of uh, the history of our country here. Up next, we introduce you to René Tromel, also known as the Maple Man. Not only is he the fifth generation in his maple syrup family, but he's also given back by planting over three million trees in his lifetime.
I'm a living uh, legend. You know, I'm still uh, alive today and show people a tradition that was uh, old and a couple generations. So uh, this is the, the biggest reason why they call me the Maple Man. Je suis René Turmel et je suis uh, le Maple Man. So we have my grandfather, my father, me, and my nephew, and his little children. So basically, it's five generations that I'm transmitting the, the tradition. My grandfather had been making maple syrup too, so then my father kept the, the tradition, and uh, he was very passionate about the maple syrup making. And, uh, and then it, it, it came to me, and like I said, all I did was just Watching my dad was such a, an experience. Doing it the old-fashioned way with the bucket is you take some of the sap. Uh, that's what I like about doing it the old-fashioned way because uh, we respect the tree, his, his cycle of life, you know. He, he needs water too, you know. <laughs> In the morning when I feed my horse and then when we go collect the sap, this is, I really love that because just to have my connection with the horse, it's something very unique. Starting the fire, you know, every 15 minutes and then keep checking the sap coming in the stove and uh, then see the, the sap changing colors, you know, and getting thicker. When you taste the, the syrup at the end, that's the biggest gift uh, of the day. I take something from the tree, like the sap, but then I, I like to give back to the, the, the nature. Myself, I've planted trees in BC. Uh, I started, I was 16 years old, and I planted three million trees all over BC, help the nature uh, grow again and keep uh, their cycle of life. I keep doing it because I really love it. it. You know, to be in contact with nature, you know, there's nothing like it. It's my favorite things to do. I really think I am an uh, ambassador of uh, Canada, so that's why I'm, I'm very proud to be Canadian because uh, I'm uh, teaching, you know, the, uh, the tradition, the legend. I believe I'm the most Canadian man because uh, I've been doing a lot of things inside the, the whole country, making maple syrup in Quebec, planting three million trees uh, in BC. Very proud to give back to uh, the Canadian people the, the very rich uh, tradition. Country music has strong roots in Canada and has played a significant role in our Canadian culture and identity, particularly on the prairies. As a traditional Western singer and songwriter, Larry Krauss draws on that rich history to reflect on the people, places and times that have shaped the pioneering spirit that runs deep across this land. When you hear a great song, the first time you hear it, you realize that it connected. And I think that's probably one of the biggest things about music, country or otherwise, is the connection of the song to the people that are listening to it. My name is Larry Krause, and I'm a Western Roots singer-songwriter. What really resonates with me in my Western Roots music is the fact that it talks about the people, places, and times that created the West that we know and, and live in today. A lot of times the story that's being told in the song is something that people can readily identify with and that allows them to be able to embrace that style of music and the musician that, that's making it. History can be learned and, and preserved through music by continuing the trends and, and the traditions that we've had. Some of the Canadian artists that have basically created the, the Canadiana genre, at least in the Western aspect of it, they, they always talk in terms of Wolf Carter as the founder of Canadian country music. 
Once you start looking further down the trail, people like Ian Tyson, uh, Gordon Lightfoot, Gary Felgard, they're all very much pioneers in Canadian country music. You see very strong representation of Canadian, I guess, values and also of Canadian musicianship and uh, them getting down the story of Canada. It's good that a music reflects where it's come from and that's a big part of the kind of music that, that I make. At any time that, that I've written something that is a story that I feel I want to get down for other people to listen to, one of the biggest efforts that I make is to try and make that song timeless. Spent the time in the rat race, watched towers touch the skies. The city spread another two blocks every time I closed my eyes. I've been longing for the Northland, the lakes, streams, the pines. So I loaded up the truck one day and headed back to the Timberline. So it's not a matter that it got written in 2022. But that same song with that same circumstance could have been written in 1964. The audience that country music resonates to being as, as broad as what it is all comes back to, to the storytelling and the fact that, that people can relate to it. The feeling that you get from writing a song and, and getting it into the studio and producing it and hearing the final outcome once, once you get the recording all done up, it's an incredible satisfaction knowing that something that just started off as a <laughs> dumb idea, next thing you know, ended up into something that's tangible, something that people are taking home, and, and the feeling that you've been able to reach out and have that kind of impact on somebody is just absolutely incredible. Country music is, is a part of a very diverse musical environment that Canada has right now. There's lots of room for country music, but there's also lots of room for all kinds of other different types of music. Just like anything else that's in society, it's constantly evolving, it's constantly changing. We have to remember where we came from and we have to appreciate what happened in the past, but that doesn't stop us from embracing what's coming down the pipe in the future. Keep on the sunny side, always on the sunny side. Keep on the sunny side of life. It will help us every day. It will brighten all the way when you keep on the sunny side of life. Canadians love their sports. And Nanaimo's Dan Marshall has turned his love of Canada's two national sports, lacrosse and hockey, into a fantastic career. The biggest thing is to do it, to not wait for the moment or when the time is right. You're doing something that quite honestly you would like to do anyway, even if there wasn't any pay for it. To be able to work in two sports that dovetail each other so perfectly, I'm in an arena almost every month of the year. It's a fantastic tradition to be a part of, and it is special. Hansen moving ahead, looking towards the net. Joe Hansen trying to swim through with a shot. Bowden trying to stop it, and it leaks behind him for a goal. Beautiful play there. I don't think I ever realized that it was something that could be a career. I always enjoyed it. I was a bit of a ham. I had a problem with my feet that was going to allow me to not ever skate. So I knew I was never going to play ice hockey. Three, two, one. So I fell in love with road hockey and played road hockey hours and hours growing up. I was always talking through it, announcing for myself and my friends, announcing table hockey games, road hockey games. Just always did it for fun and I always felt I was pretty good at it. My friends always enjoyed when I would do it. Rippen puts it on goal, Brasso scores on the rebound! But as I started to think in grade 11 and 12, what comes next? There wasn't anything specific about how to be a play-by-play -play announcer, but I had an instructor who I knew was sports-minded and I said, I really want to try and develop this skill, what can I do? And he gave great advice, which is just go and do it. 
And so I would take a recorder and I would go to minor hockey games or junior hockey games and record myself doing play-by-play. -play. And sometimes I didn't even know who the players were. Sometimes it was very generic. Number 11 to number 12, it was that basic, but a great way to develop skills. And I'm looking for another transition tally. Wiedemann shoots, scores in the top corner, Adam Wiedemann. At the very beginning of internet online broadcasting, I was able to do some lacrosse games that people would listen to and comment on. Zach Mans bringing up the offense. That was where I really started to do full games of commentary. Goes the double team is coming, put it in front for Zach Mans. A shot and a great stop by Bowden. The first time I was legitimately doing hockey play-by-play -play in 2000. Hugh Larkin over the line right side, driving to the goal center, pass, they score! What a rush by Larkin. I got hired to be the voice of the Penticton Panthers. I'm thankful that Penticton was really, really desperate because they took a chance hiring me with literally a homemade demo tape that on the label had me writing on it in felt pen. Brasso's got two guys on him, but he got it loose for Yanni Caldas in close, trying to jam play, then a shot by Brasso scores! Devin Brasso, lucky number 13 on the year. I had a little bit of an aptitude for it. I could tell that right away. If I could just develop some skills and get over being nervous, I thought it might work. Here's a centering pass, a chance all over from the score! Larkin! Three nothing, Cowichan! Hockey's a little bit tougher when it comes to the keeping up because it's a bit scrambly and the puck is going from team to team and stick to stick. Coming through center, but he couldn't take the puck away from Gavin Gould to the clipper line. Hookison belted him down. Whereas lacrosse, it's more fluid. Possession tends to last for a longer time. Rowe coming ahead with Smith there, two on one. Rowe for Smith, shooting one, Bowden a big save down on his knees. But both move at a very high pace, and that's part of the fun. The fluidity and the pace of what you're doing, where your cadence is very high, and your excitement level can be very high because there's a lot happening. The counter flip ball, John Phillips, look, shoots, scores in the top corner, John Phillips. I would like to go to the highest level possible. And whatever that is for me, make that your NHL, make that your National Lacrosse League. And I think if you can do that, you're always gonna have the right level of enjoyment. Prosik to the middle for Armstrong in tight, faking, oh, Claxton coming across. 22 years of announcing, if it stops being fun, that'll be the day that I'll know it's time to do something else and maybe go get a real job for the first time ever. McComber making moves, spinning, McComber in a low, scores! Teoshin Tate McComber, an overtime winner in the Bible. Thank you so much for touring along with us today. We've enjoyed being your guides and showing you our backyard. If you would like to see more Canadian stories, follow Shaw Spotlight on social media or check out shawspotlight.ca. I feel uh, proud to be, if you will, kind of a sand ambassador when I travel. And it feels pretty cool to be celebrated in that way. They would come back after the war and they had won to own their own plane. So he designed that plane for four people, mother, father, two children, and luggage. not grinding away at a job you don't like. You're doing something that quite honestly you would like to do anyway, even if there wasn't any pay for it. 